the only thing we look at in, in innovation, what's the newest innovations? Things to uh, encapsulate your mind, like, wow, you got the Vision Pro, whatever, something to put you into a metaverse in a, in a non-real, a non-physical universe. Wow, that's a great invention. Uh, Zoom improved so you could do online calls so you don't have to be in person with another person. All the innovations that we're seeing are about separating humanity. A great way to buy debt, to print money and pull it into the now so that you you, you have it. So yeah, this this deflationary debt super cycle going bust right now. And then, you know, one of the ways that you can buy time, maybe even get it under control, is when all else fails, they take you to war. And so you can get away with spending, really ultimately printing endless money. I think with the, the farmers right now in, in, in Europe, um, I think one of the things that was learned, if you look at previous times that farmers have uh, protested, and you also look at the Yellow Vest movement in France, one of the things that I think people have learned is that it's all or nothing. Because if you protest to any great extent, like these uh, farmers that are out there, if you don't win, they're going to come collect you up later. And I think that's something that is still unfolding. So either win or, like I say, they'll just, it may take them a while, but, you know, the vengeance of a narcissistic, psychopathic government, well, it's its endless. And so it may take them a few years, but they'll get y'all. Uh, you know, you'll be walking to your car and somebody will say, hey, I haven't seen you a long time, you know, and like shake your hand, and which is your strong hand, you know, and the next thing you know, someone puts a bag over your head and they toss you in a, in a vehicle and you disappear. So. That, I think, is the reality. So what I think the farmers there in Europe have realized is that they've lost hope. So they, they knew two things. One, we have to go all the way. It's all or nothing. We have to drive to the capitals. We have to shut down the cities. And we have to make our demands extremely clear. We have to, you know, fill their uh, supermarkets with wastewater. we got to dig trenches on the highways. We have to go big all the way. Instead of guillotines now, I do prefer the slightly more civilized, uh, huge mounds of compost, you know, <laughs> and poop, of course, outright non-composted poop just surrounding the government buildings. Like I say, they realized they had to do all or nothing. They had to win or they'd be collected up later. And it looks like they are winning. I think one of the things that truly inspired this is uh, a loss of hope. I do think what keeps a society functioning underneath a government whether that government is totally crappy and corrupt or whether it's a you know a good government is hope if people believe that their children their grandchildren will have at least the same world that they did where there was some ability to function and and, and make a better life for yourself or at least sustain yourself then you're going to be somewhat dulcet. You're going to be cool with it. You know, whether your hope is very small as far as just getting by for your children, for your grandchildren, or whether you see a great future for them in the country that you live in, all it takes is a little hope and people will be cool. They'll, 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 just, they'll put up with just about anything. But I believe that these farmers had no hope. And that's where the fascist governments, that's where things like the EU, unelected officials, the WEF, the, you know, the World Economic Forum, et cetera, all these horrible things. Where they screw up is they push too hard and too fast. And the people weren't, I guess, domesticated enough to be passive enough not to care. And the people didn't have hope. The farmers didn't have hope. All of them are out of business. I mean, you look at it, the, uh, you know, you, you've got your farmland. I mean, people, many people who haven't farmed anything, I've only farmed a little bit, you know, farmed a couple of acres professionally for a while. And people may not realize that it's a hard job. You have to find people to buy your produce. You know, you're going to be organic or you mean natural or you're not going to care, you know, um, except for extremely huge agribusiness. Many small farmers under like, let's say, 20 or 30 or 50 acres, a lot of them don't own all their own, own equipment. They're in an area where other people are farming and they're sharing equipment. Water is a complete 
big deal. Do you have it in the ground? Will the government let you use it? You know, are you irrigating from up in the hills? You know, are you walking your ditches and, and turn the gates on and off to get your water? Do you have a pond? Can you pump your water? Um, I mean, there's anyone who's farm knows it just goes on forever. So it's a full-time job managing your land. And it is uh, hard to, and, and once you actually have things growing, I mean, you have to realize every year, I mean, some people, some people do collect seed, and that's a good idea, of course, but in many cases, you're, you're also buying seed. Um, let's say that the market wants something you haven't grown before, and you don't have seed for it, you know, um, or you didn't get good seed the previous year or previous years, um, so then you have to buy seeds. Seeds can be a fortune going into a new, a new growing season. So these farmers are working hard, and a lot of them just get by. Some do well, and it depends on the year. Um, but you don't you don't see many wealthy farmers, not many. You know, most are middle class at best. So people who don't have a great economic situation, who are working hard as it is, oftentimes it's generations of struggle to make it work, and they have a you know a certain consistency. And they're making money, but uh, once that's taken from them, and there's no hope, they've been taxed to a point where they can't make money. Um, yeah, the, the land being rewilded. You know, I wish I had the article. I saw something about that where. It's sort of a, a version of imminent domain in Europe where they're about with the rewilding saying that you know, we need to rewild this land. So we're going to, you know, buy your land or take it or something like that. Um, those farmers didn't have hope. And that's like I say, that's where the empire screws up because they didn't have hope, but they did have land in many cases that was their own, a business that was their own. Um, a family business, you know, that would have been passed down, like like where their kids and grandkids might be working it already. And um, their entire future of their family, their their livelihood, their future generations just got flushed down the toilet for what they know is is crap. Like they know the greens over there in Europe just want them all dead. You know, I, there's a certain cynicism and a certain enlightenment that I see taking place and. It's really one of those things where I can't get too attached to which way it goes, but I see the farmer's rebellion as being successful because they knew we're going to have to get in there, shut down a city, get in their face, tell them what they're going to do, and they're going to do it. I think it was all or nothing, and I, I think it even could have come to a situation, and I hope it, hope it stays peaceful, but where it's not peaceful, in a sense. I believe that that actually could take place. You know, and I hope it does stay peaceful, but they're all or nothing. They know they have to win. They're winning. I hope that's setting the stage for 2024 to show the governments what happens when people have their hope taken from them. These farmers have their hope taken from them. Don't mess with a person who has nothing to lose. It's like in the art of war. You know, don't fight a person with nothing to lose. Don't fight a person who's lost their mind. Don't fight somebody who's fighting for their children and grandchildren to survive it just won't work so i think the narcissistic psychopathic evil governments of europe which is what they are at this point just like ours here in america the people have completely lost control of the governments and it didn't just happen i think that hopefully will be in 2024 the first battle that is won where the governments realize that when people far before people are beaten they will not have hope they'll know there is no hope unless they Build the damn government buildings up with with sewage <laughs> and dig trenches in the highways and get in their face and say, you're going to do this. Because those farmers show the reality that their voices were not heard, just like no Western civilization, right? Just like no Western country's voice is heard as far as the civilians. And uh, those farmers are badasses. You know, I really commend them. I think it's incredible bravery. My hope is that we begin to see more intelligent and creative, nonviolent protesting here in this country. So we, we really, my hope is that we need our, our farmers here and the people here to start doing the same thing. Because if it hasn't become clear to people, I just don't know how to work with people who don't get it. If it hasn't become clear that it doesn't matter if you know, and it doesn't matter what you maybe write your congressperson, none of that crap matters. I think, I think it's all going to come down to we're all going to be part of the Farmers' Rebellion pretty soon. And when the government uh, of your state, of the, of the federal government, etc., has no choice but do what you say because you're quite literally in their face, 
that's when we're going to see a, a change in the opinion of our of our state and federal governments. But until then, until we have a farmers' rebellion here, we're pretty screwed. You know, we will continue to fund awful wars around this world. The Gerald Salente, the guy who writes a Trends Journal, he says, you know, when all else fails, they take you to war. And I think that if we don't get a farmers' rebellion here, and really a people's rebellion at large, then we're just going to war. And I'm sorry if you're a young person or if you have kids, but they're going to if you don't join the crowd. But I think that's exactly what it takes to get people crazy enough to peacefully smack the government in the head and say, enough of your warmongering nonsense. Just go away. One way or the other, we got to get creative. We got to get creative like the Farmers' Rebellion. So anyway, I think if we get creative, I think if people start to lose hope and before they and before they have no ability to actually resist, they get out and they do exactly what was happening there, here, and they continue to do it there. It doesn't take that much of the population for the government to realize that when ultimately the people are in their face and just say, you're done, shut up. I think that's when you see the world change. I'm, I'm optimistic. If you think about it, before this latest farmers' rebellion happened, did anybody think it was possible? I, I didn't realize it was going to happen, uh, but it did. You know, you think about, um, did anybody think that Britain would ever leave India? No. Apartheid would ever end? Nope, not really. Did anybody think that the uh, South Africa would be kicking the French out so they can sell the uranium for what it should cost rather than pennies? Nope. But the world's changing really fast. And uh, I don't know. I'm starting to see society get a little bit crazy. You know, I think there's two trains. You got your love train, your fear train. And I think the love train's got more people on it. And they're both leaving in opposite directions from the train station. You forgot the soul train, baby. Oh, yeah, I know. They're, 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 you got the, the love train and the soul train connecting at the back there. Oh, yeah, the love train, the soul train. <laughs> Yeah, it does seem at the end of an empire or the end of a cycle that uh, things are purposely let to self-destruct. Like we have to get used to a world right now where the substandard is the new normal and that it's just the way it is. With a lot of people that have departed this realm, we start to see that there's not enough qualified replacement to take over their positions. So the downward spiral is, and again, walk with me on the mind experiment here yes imagine the elite know a new cycles inbound well would you try to salvage anything they would you try to extract all the wealth and the resources that you would need to survive through the change hold that keep that tight but the rest of it is disposable expendable because it would be anyway so to just try to keep characters like you say the newlands and the grams etc in place just long enough to keep it like you guys Keep control on the on the surface of the planet while we hang out underground here and wait for it to finish. I mean, what kind of world is it where the largest market cap on the planet is keeping you sick and keeping perpetual wars moving forward? If those industries had dissolved, sure, there'd be a lot of money lost. But look at our current state of affairs on the planet. How's the world revolving economically? It's all revolving around the war machine, if you will. And also, nothing ever gets better. You're not supposed to get better. If you got better, you got a lost customer. So, you know, on that side of things, too, you're looking at these inversions of everybody knows there's an end of something here that the world is not meant to continue forward on its trajectory as it was in like you and I growing up, 1980s, 90s, there was the hope. You could see it continuing. There was innovation, but we've reached this stagnation point probably around, you know, 2019, just before COVID hit. And now the only thing we look at in, in innovation, what's the newest innovations? Things to uh, encapsulate your mind, like, wow, you got the Vision Pro, whatever, something to put you into a metaverse in a, in a non-real a non-physical universe. Wow, that's a great invention. Uh, Zoom improved so you could do online calls so you don't have to be in person with another person. All the innovations that we're seeing are about separating humanity. And, you know, nothing else has really improved. Can you think of any great inventions in the last five years? You think about the year 2000, there was always something new, something coming out, improving humanity, making life easier, more exciting, 
different and better and, and reducing time, but now all we see is things that have been invented to separate or destroy humanity. This is Mysteries in the Histories. Over a period of six weeks in 1994, the small town of Oakville, Washington was hit with a bizarre string of storms that rained weird gelatinous blobs all over the town. And then people started getting sick. This is the weird and still unsolved mystery of the Oakville blobs. It began raining the clear gelatinous goop on the 7th of August. No one knew where it came from or what it was. The blobs contained similar looking white cells as humans. People in the town who had contact with the blobs began feeling sick and scared a few hours later. Residents in the small city reported that what fell from the sky was not water, but gooey, slimy, clear and translucent blobs the size of a grain of rice. Over the next three weeks, in an area measuring 20 square miles, there would be five more events of the terrifying ooze raining down on unsuspecting citizens. There were reports of people developing flu-like symptoms from contact or proximity to the blobs even of animals dying, the very day of the raining blobs. So what was it? And was it making people sick? A sample of the Oakville blobs was sent to the Hazardous Material Unit at the Department of Ecology of Washington State. Once received microbiologist Mike McDowell found two species of bacteria in the Oakville blobs, stating one of these was known to infect the human digestive system. But scientist Mike Osweiler of the Washington State Department said they found a number of cells of various sizes and two types of bacteria in the blobs, but were unable to identify them. They did, however, note that the cells did not have nuclei. This was significant because it refuted a previous claims that the blobs contained human-like white blood cells, which do have nuclei. So what were the Oakville blobs? One theory is that it was jellyfish or parts of jellyfish dispersed into rain clouds by bombing runs carried out by the Air Force. Another theory, fluid waste from an airplane toilet, but the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration pointed out that this would have been blue, not translucent. Still another theory is that of an example of panspermia, an event dropping the unknown cells down upon the Earth. Panspermia is the hypothesis that life exists throughout the universe distributed by space dust, meteoroids, asteroids, comets, and maybe even clouds of raining blobs, perhaps. What if it was fluid waste from a UFO or UAP toilet? Just think about that for a minute. Ever since the 14th century, there have been reports of a substance very similar to the blobs in Oakville being found elsewhere, called star jelly, astral jelly, or astromixin, named after the legend that it falls from the sky during meteor showers. What if the blobs never rained in the first place, that they emerged from a more earthly plane? This would require overlooking the witness statements of those who saw the blobs fall. But it has been a theory. All the original uncollected blobs have long disappeared, and there are no known remaining samples of the Oakville blobs, including at the Washington Department of Health. They apparently have no records of ever receiving any, but allegedly. The Washington State Department took all known samples and somehow misplaced them. Inter alia, frog spawn, sodium polyacrylate crystals or algae have been the source of other blob events. However, there are many unexplained instances of the raining goop, including in 2013 when slime was found at the Ham Wall Nature Reserve in Somerset, England. Despite sending samples for DNA testing to the Natural History Museum, just like in Oakville, no conclusion was ever reached or explanation given. Raining Blobs of Oakville is another one of the great mysteries in the histories. Sign up to our show notes email list and get access to longer episodes of Mysteries in the Histories just for signing up. Signing up for the show notes, you get behind the scenes thoughts and points we sometimes can't relay over social media platforms. Brought to you by ITM Trading. ITM Trading has spent the last 28 plus years developing a team of expert researchers and gold and silver analysts to make this possible. Simply put, we build strategies which are historically proven to protect your wealth and assets through any economic downturn. 866-834-1422. That's 866-834-1422. And now on with the video. That's it.
So you can see we kind of turned a corner there somewhere. The governments, the way they're operating inefficiently and not at all, barely. Everything is contracting generally around the planet, except for a few nations. And then you look to see uh, the movement of crop zones would be a good one, a good way to put it. But, you, you know, to put that into context, you got to think about the farmer's strike in America. If there was a farmer's rebellion, almost all agribiz in America is controlled by Monsanto, Sargenta, and they're the landowners of the farms themselves and the equipment. And the farms are so large here. That's the huge difference. European farms, generally a 20 acre or under farm is the average size. Five acres for the locals is a decent size of land to have in Europe. You know, 20 acre farms bordering on the large size, even in vineyards, you know, families come together and, and couple their lands, but we don't really have that too much. So each five acre or 10 acre or 20 acre owner of a farm in Europe has a tractor. So when you see these tractors all over the roads, that's a combination of thousands and thousands and thousands of these five, 10, 20, 50 acre owners that are coming together in unison. But here in the States, you got a, a fleet of tractors on 10,000 or 100,000 acres as a single tract out in the middle of like Kansas somewhere, all controlled by Fortune 500 owned machinery can computer controlled that can be flicked at a switch to just stop dead on the road. You know, that John Deere did over in uh, the Ukraine when Russia was loading a bit of the equipment on some trains to take it back and be like, we can use this. John Deere turned it all off remotely. Wow, I didn't know that. So the, what do you consider a, a farmer rebellion in America would be a little more difficult to pull off just from the sheer magnitude of the size of the farms and the sheer absolute domination and control of Fortune 500 agribusiness on it. Yeah, sure, you might have a few small stakeholders here and there that have smaller farms, but to get it to the level of the European farmer, we'd have to blast back in the past into probably the 1920s or 1930s again to get that level of uh, number of machines and cooperations and people who had land that was gonna be lost. Because you know, the thing today would be the equivalent here in America is maybe losing your house. Because if you, if you, I encourage everybody, I probably said it 50 times, so I'm going to say it the 51st time, you need to watch the movie The Great Taking. And I don't know, Craig, if you've seen that one, but the blueprinted, scripted plan to confiscate all assets in terms of land and your house is already built into the next banking collapse in terms of a bail-in, not just your funds that are held in savings and checking accounts and uh, safety deposit boxes in the banks. But this will also include all mortgages, lands and homes held in those mortgages bailed into the banks also where they will take 100% possession. Even if you're a single payment away from paying off your house after 30 years, you will lose it. The bank will own it. This is one of the most important movies ever released, ever. Everybody must watch this movie. Uh, you, you might not understand finance and uh, terms, but by the end of the movie, you'll be familiar enough that they make it easy enough to follow. If you already know some of those terms, by the end of the movie, you'll, you're, you're going to be your skin will be goose skin. Go, oh, that's impossible. They've already done this so so well, to, well oiled it to steal everything on the planet into the hands of the same dynastic families again. It's a upsetting movie. <clears throat> it's a riveting movie. It's an exciting movie to watch. And I encourage everybody again to really delve into it. I'd like to talk about that movie. You know, I don't know if you've seen it or not because you know, you trade in crypto a bit and uh, you know, you're pretty familiar with markets. Like how true do you think that script is where they could actually bail in all mortgages across the planet while starting mainly with the United States and Canada on a bank bail-in on a catastrophic banking failure? I watched uh parts of the great taking but not all of it but definitely I have i do think that setup is definitely underway as far as the great bail-in um because uh you've got the fed right now i would say buying debt and that's helping to hold the market up uh right now where we are where america is looking to fight any war it possibly can or if you won't fight us we'll just bomb you and we'll see if you we'll see if we can get you to you know shoot back or something like that and so realize that war spending is part of the gdp 
you know, everywhere you look, there's this these non-human hominid invasive species that are at the control levels of government and military, but are absolutely doing non-human maneuvers toward us, the people of this planet. Our backs are against the wall, just as the farmers are in every way, shape, form, facet, whether you're going to earn money, it seems like wages are decreasing far. Food is getting more and more ridiculously unhealthy. You know, if you look at the packaging, you know, there's a new law that just starts here on March 1st. And if you want to look at the United States Department of Agriculture website, the USDA website, uh, the new food labeling GMO laws come in March 1st here. Companies have already shifted away and started to rebrand it called bioengineered foods. So on the cans, on the boxes, it'll say made with bioengineered ingredients. Now, a few companies took the forward step, and I think they started at the beginning of the year just making their boxes because they knew they had to here coming up in March. If you bought any food within the last three months, look on the back of the box or on the can, and it could say used something bioengineered ingredients. That is a rebranding of GMO because people are becoming aware of GMO. Now, these products that have multiple GMO products overlaid, interlaced with it, whether it be GMO corn, the GMO corn syrup, it might be GM rice, and maybe you'll have a product that has five or six or eight bioengineered ingredients in it. They are legally and now allowed to put a QR code on the label where you actually have to go into the supermarket with your app and scan it to see what the ingredients are because they've overlaid so many GM ingredients that it's literally 100% fictitious, non-nutritious food. I'm not going to say non, nearly non-digestible to the point where they disguise it with QR codes, which is within the law now. So who has the time to go in and you know, have the app and you're a family, you're, you're a mom and you're running in to buy for your two or three kids. You're, you're on the clock until the next thing where a kid's got to be dropped off, sent home. Something's got to be cooked. You're, you're in a mad dash to get in that supermarket and out. Do you think you'll have the uh, time to scan each QR code and look at the ingredients in there? I don't think so. Yeah. I think that we're kind of at the end of a, uh, a debt super cycle, I believe is what it was what it was called in The Great Taking. And there's a great guy, uh, Gregory Manorino, does a podcast every day. He does two a day about the Fed and buying debt and such. I look at the world right now and I see this. It's been a unipolar world for a long time. And, you know, America misbehaved with its dollar supremacy that was created in the 70s, taking the, the dollar off the gold standard. You know, the, the dollar is as much of a, a, a weapon as any nuclear bomb is. It's not the American people, but just, you know, you could say American empire, you know, American like colonialist thought, basically. So I think that it is a debt super cycle and the great taking. I think what I kind of got from it, the Fed, I guess you could say the Federal Reserve, which is not a government agency. It's private. It buys debt like the whole the whole repo market that we have so that banks stay solvent overnight it's it's a big mess i mean the more you learn about it the more it will keep you up at night just realizing how our economy to a great extent teeters on disaster and that's really not something that the working person did who wipes foot off their brow and you know creates whatever they create does whatever they do to make money i mean the american people in general i think are more frugal than they're given credit for i don't think as many people live up, up, up beyond their means as is accused I don't think there's any way around kind of a reckoning for it. I think that's one of the desperations. A great way to buy debt, to print money and pull it into the now so that you, you have it. So yeah, this this deflationary debt super cycle going bust right now. And then, you know, one of the ways that you can buy time, maybe even get it under control, is when all else fails, they take you to war. And so you can get away with spending, really ultimately printing endless money. And even though you're devaluing the crap out of the dollar, it gives you this, this ability because the people are now scared. They think the bad guys are going to come get us. If you don't fight them over there, you'll fight them here and all that crap. I think that our government being so hell-bent on starting World War III, wherever they can make it happen. And I think that, like I say, that is one of the greatest ways to, to just print the crap out of money. So ultimately... You start thinking where 
it's not the hard work an American person doing this, but when you look at just the way things have been managed, you know, on like the empire level, the only way they can kind of get the economy rocking so that they don't lose control because of a economic crash is to take us to war. It works. We'll see if they pull it off, but it's difficult because what is it like the BRIC nations, I think, have a greater like GDP ultimately than the G7 at this point. So we've been a unipolar world. And we've abused it, especially with the dollar weaponized as much as any nuclear weapon ever was. And now you've got the BRICS. And I think you look at the, the BRICS that are very happy on a certain level because of just that as they, as they talk about in the great taking the debt super cycle. And if people do watch it, you realize that we've been controlled by debt and then interest levels, interest rates, et cetera. So if I call it like, the empire, you can call it the Fed, whatever you want, the great taking, you can decide who and what it is. You know, they want to own everything. You know, it is basically a desire to go back to a, a, a new, it's like neo-feudalism, ultimately. You know, get in touch with that inner John Wick. Get to know the high table. And, and you're going to watch that and look around. And, Holy crap. This is how it really works. And it's right here surrounding me all the time. It's actually a more probably poignant and important uh, movie about how things work, the hidden world that we don't see but exists than The Matrix was. I want to be paid in the gold coins. Like the slid gold coins over the counter. I truly believe that's more of a mm-hmm. documentary series yes. than it is a, a fiction film. Just the way it works at the highest levels when you got billionaires and, and multi-billionaires. Like that kind of level of opulence and security. And those who don't want to agree to certain mergers or those who will disagree on ways to take companies. It's just that's just the way it is. There, some things always pay for higher there. Like how much would you have to protect yourself? Truly, if you had billions running a company that was competing with other billionaires, I mean, the levels they go to and the private security they need to stop themselves from being in danger is just kind of a little over the top ridiculous where you ask yourself, would you even want to be in that billionaire world? You know, because there's always a threat, either from the kidnapping or, or from those that are in competition that want you eliminated to watch it, especially that first one and the third one. Yeah, the other two I didn't care for, but. You know, the documentary is uh, plainly to see in front of you. And once you realize the amount of money and power that these people have that have accumulated what money does buy the power and the power buys and, and creates the money. It's a different way to look at Fortune 500 companies or these persons who are above that level that have dynastic wealth. When you're looking into like the black nobility from Italy or if you're going to swing back over into something more traditional as the, the Rothschilds, et cetera. If you go over and you look at the Venetian nobility, because I visited Venice, kept seeing the double-headed eagle everywhere, and I delved into the history of Venice. Uh, it seems like the cataclysm after. There was a world cataclysm uh, during the Greek, and then subsequently thereafter, a very small one at what we consider the ancient Romans, and the surviving nobility class of that, that still had seafaring trade, had reset themselves up in Venice. And of all things, all the money and the intermarrying of families and the, and the different nobility families like the Sassoons and different things that have made their list. How long would you really be able to exist in that world? I'm wondering how many in, the, in that world are really clones now because they've been removed, but they still need the figure. Yes, head. Because I was looking at this military meeting yesterday, and uh, it had all the generals, it's a mix of different countries all together. And I was just thinking, that is a group of yes men. All I did was look at that. The higher the rank on the uniform was the more of a yes man that there was in the room. So everybody trusted everybody else in the room because they were all yes men. Like the only reason they got to that area or that level was because they said yes to every single thing. They never said no even once, no matter what the order was, no matter what the request was. They never said no, not even once. That's how they were trusted in that arena that they're in, as everybody with that rank and file is totally trustable because they're a yes, a yes man. And that is no different than climbing your way up a greasy ladder in corporate 500 America or corporate 500 anywhere world. Yes, men and women move their way up the ladder. They never rocked a boat. You know, if you get up to those upper levels, 
They're always yes, and they never cause a problem, they never rock a boat, and they consistently go along with the agendas of the companies, and they never question, they just yes, yes, yes. And that's another unique thing. So when you come into a group of top 100, uh, so we'll use Fortune 500 CEOs, CFOs, COOs, if you get them all into a room, they're all going to be unanimously very similar cut and paste personalities of yes, 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 company, company, company. And that's the profile. It seems like our world's a scripted world. And the biggest thing that the, that the companies or the, the news has done for us is they gave us the BRICS currency head fake. Now, is this BRICS currency ever going to really manifest? I don't know if it is. But what they did set up in the head fake of everybody looking for a unified single currency was they set up this interoperable system for sovereign settlement between themselves while nobody was looking. Like everybody was looking for Brazil, Russia, China, everybody to come in and now India and uh, now Saudi Arabia and who else? There's all these other OPEC nations just joined BRICS too. So there's now BRICS plus uh, 15, I, I believe it is. So there's 15 additional nations in addition to the original, what you know is Brazil, China, India, Russia, South Africa. So everybody was looking for a unified currency, like one bill, like a hundred dollar brick note, for an example, uh, that would come out and be distributed amongst all the nations that are involved in the BRICS. And it could be convertible just like a USDC is convertible. A dollar in the world anywhere is a dollar. But they had faked everybody. The whole time you were distracted and governments were distracted looking for these meetings when they were going to try to create the currency. What they were really doing was creating a system where they could just trade outside the dollar and settle in their own currencies amongst each other. That was the biggest and greatest head fake art of war maneuver ever accomplished. There's far, far, far less usage of the U.S. dollar across the world for settlement, especially even in oil transactions.